Hello, it gives me great pleasure to welcome my two speakers. Uh, Adaf Saref and Mohsin Hamid. Adaf is the author, among other titles, of the best-selling The Map of Love, shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 1999 and translated into more than 30 languages. And Cairo, A City Transformed, her account of the Egyptian Revolution in 2011. She is also a political and cultural commentator. Her book, Metazera, has been influential, and her articles for The Guardian are published in the European and American press. From 2011 to 2015, she wrote a weekly column for the Egyptian national daily, Al Sharouf. Al Sharouk? Yes, Sharouk. Sharouk. In 2007, she founded the Palestine Festival for Literature, PalFest, which takes place in the cities of occupied Palestine and Gaza. Out of that, she co-edited This Is Not a Border, Reportage and Reflections from the Palestine Festival of Literature. She was the first recipient of the Mahmoud Darwesh Award, Palestine, 2010, and received the European Cultural Foundation 2019 Princess Marguerite Award. And Mohsin, of course, who you all know extremely well, um, she, he is the author of four novels, Mott Smoke, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, How to Get Fifthly Rich in Rising Asia and Exit West, and a book of essays, Discontent and Its Civilizations. He has also been shortlisted for the Booker Prize and won many others. His writing has been translated into 40 languages, featured or bestseller lists, and adapted for the cinema. Born in Lahore, he has spent much, about half his life there, much of the rest in London, New York, and California. Please welcome them both. So the question I'm going to ask both of them is, what were your aspirations when you started writing? Adolf, I think you can begin. Um, well, I guess it was very simple. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd read so much. My favorite pastime in that time, very long ago, when children didn't really have much to do beyond reading. Um, so I, I thought, I mean, really, it was just to see my name on the cover of a book, and then maybe to see that book in the window of a bookshop. And so that was, that was really when it stopped, actually. I, I didn't envisage anything beyond that. But when did you, when did you start this? When the, with, with the children around or what before? When, when, when you were hard? My kids? Uh, no, I, uh, well, I started when I finished my PhD. So basically, I kind of, uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't do sort of like writing as a young person, stuff that I threw away later. None of that at all, although I was sort of, writing in my head, I guess, the whole time, and reading loads. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically when I finished, I finished my PhD, and there was time between the handing it in and the viva, and uh, that was the first time ever since I was aware that I had actually been free, because I come from an academic family, and so basically you weren't done until you'd done a PhD. and. Um, and so I'd done that, and there was this hiatus before the Viva, at, and one day I was, um, I was at home, and I actually remember thinking, well, you, you, you don't have to sit down and do your PhD. You haven't particularly got anything to do. You're not going out. So if you've always thought you were going to be a writer, why aren't you writing now? And it was a, a good question. And so actually I sat down and started my first story, and that was the collection that came out as Aisha in 1983. Yeah. Yes, which I read all those years ago and I loved. Mm -hmm. uh, Mohsen, what about you? What, how did you start off? What do you, do you think about yourself as a writer? And like, like Adaf, when I was um, uh, young, there wasn't much to do, so I read a lot. And in Lahore in the 80s, we had one TV channel. It would come on around five or six maybe four or five in the afternoon, um, and then shut off at 11, 12 at night. And um, there was no internet. Uh, uh, so I hung out with my cousins, and I you know, went to school and read books. And uh, 
I didn't really think I could be a writer because I didn't know anybody who was one. Um, or actually, I did know people, in fact, who were, but I had no idea that they were writers, uh, in a way. Um, my, my father's cousin uh, was already a poet, and there were other people who were doing things, but as a teenage boy, um, the stuff that I was reading, you know, Dune by Frank Herbert, I didn't know Frank Herbert. Uh, so, uh, um, but then I began to read a little bit of, you know, Babsi, um, who I didn't know at the time, but was writing from Lahore, um, and uh, writing in English. Uh, you know, we read Manto in school, and we read, so we began to encounter that there were writers from Lahore, but again, they weren't people I knew. They, they existed, uh, and some of them existed here uh, around the same time that I was alive, uh, but it strangely just felt like a different universe. Like I was me, and then there were writers, and there were two different things. And, and um, when I went to college, I saw that there was this creative writing class that this woman who lived across the hall was taking, and I asked her, you know, what is it? And she said, well, you write stories, you know, for class. And I said, this is like a normal class? She's like, and like, and she said, yes, you can just take this class. So I took that class, and then in my last year of college, I, I decided not to write a story, but to write what became my first novel, and then took a year off after college to keep working on it, and then went to graduate school and kept working on it, got, got a job and kept working on it, and seven years later, you know, it was done. Um, but like Adap, at that point, I don't think I had much more of an ambition than, than having a book with my name on it. I didn't know what it would do in the world, I didn't know if anybody would publish it or read it. Um, just sort of stumbled into this, uh, this profession. So then, you know, I mean, so the great ambition was to have your book, you know, uh, there out in the world. But then, um, I mean, what were your then aspirations thereafter? I mean, what, 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 what have you enjoyed about writing? I mean, let's just talk, what have you, and what turned out to be different, or what happened, or looking back, what turned out to be different? Can we sort of... Well, <clears throat> I, I mean, something that Mohsen said actually triggered something for me, which is that I actually did know people who were writers as a child because, um, because my mother was a literary critic and my parents were both part of a kind of like a, a group of young artists, writers, intellectuals in, in the Egypt of the time. And so we had writers around, you know, uh, around the house and there was excitement when somebody's new story was coming out and so on. And so, and so it wasn't a world that was, that was different. And I, I think actually now it occurs to me that it, it actually seemed something that was possible to do, that you could sit down and you could write. Whereas what I would really, really have liked to do was be a rock star. Mm. But I had no means of, I mean, I couldn't see a way in which you could become a rock star. But I could sit down, you know, and write a book. So, um, yeah. Um, sorry, your question was aspirations. I, I don't think I had any no, aspirations, was, really, what? beyond beyond being so what, published. What, 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 are the, what were the joys of, then, let's put it that way, what are the joys of being okay. a writer? Well, I, th I think being a writer is most, a lot of the time is pretty miserable, I think. <laughs> because you're never done. It's not like a nine to five. I mean, there is a brief moment when you're finished a work, um, but otherwise, really, whatever you're doing, you know that you should be writing. And that is, that is not, not, not nice. And um, so, yeah, so there's sort of a, a, a guilt. Now, the thing is that, and I think that's part of the, I mean, when, like, I still would have preferred to be a rock star because I think performance things, okay, of course, I'm sure you practice and so on, but, but you do it and it's done, whereas sitting um, on your own trying to write. However, however, when you do actually, when you are writing and, and, and it is coming together and you're suddenly, you're discovering that, that at the end of a session you've actually written and thought something that you hadn't thought before, that actually it had generated a new, a new thought, a new idea, new images, and it had actually come together and was working on, on the page, then there is a, a pleasure um, 
So I, what I do is I print out and put it face down on the desk, and then in the morning I can go to my desk thinking, oh, you don't have to write. You can just read what was there and edit it. And if when you read it, it stands up and it doesn't feel like something you've written, you know, then that's a really, really good feeling. Yeah. And you, Bosin, how do you, how, what was your... Well, as, as Arif was speaking, you know, I, I, um, I began to wonder, because I also wanted to be a rock star, and, uh, <laughs> and I wonder if it's just that all writers are frustrated rock stars, um, or everybody wants to be a rock star. Exactly. Um, uh, you know, I, I think my kids wanted to be rock stars. Uh, one of them maybe still wants to be a rock star. And um, so I don't know if the universal human condition is the desire for being a rock star. Um, I, I do remember once going to a festival where in, in Marrakesh, where there were, the, there were writers, including some you know, very well-known writers who I was you know, quite in awe of. Um, and there were movie stars, and there were, you know, but there was also a, a, a genuine rock star. Um, uh, so, so, so David Gilmour was there, you know, from, from Pink Floyd. Um, and, you know, when you're in the presence of a rock star, uh, you, rec you realize that being a rock star actually is being a rock star. You know, everybody else was sort of in awe yeah. of this guy. Because, um, because you know, somebody else might have been a rock star of the cinema or a rock star of literary fiction, but that's not quite the same thing as actually being David Gilmour. Um, and so, and so you realize, but, but what is it about being a rock star that is attractive, right? It, it's you know, it's partly that you get seen. It's partly, as Adav said, that you get to perform. Um, it's, it's partly that you get to be adored, um, you get to move people. Uh, uh, but I think there's this, there's this desire to somehow connect. Uh, and, and I think for many of us, um, you know, who find our way into writing, it's a very paradoxical profession because if it is this desire to connect, we writers go about doing it in the least connected way possible. In other words, we spent all this time completely alone, in a room, just utterly alone. It's such a lonely, alone profession. Um, and it's funny that you do that. You spend years, uh, hours a day for years, working on a book so you can connect with people. Uh, it, it, it's it's, it's you know, almost insane as an activity that, that um, people who want to connect uh, do so by going into themselves and disconnecting from other people for hours every day. But, um, but maybe that is something to do with it, that there's, there's some of us who, um, whose desire to connect with other people um, only, uh, only can be expressed or can only find its right expression um, in the opposite, you know, in, in being completely alone um, and, and uh, confronting the aloneness of yourself uh, for, I think, much longer than most people do, you know, for a big chunk of your life, a writer is alone. Um, so, so if everybody wants to be a rock star, I think writers are the people who, who go about doing it in the most bizarre way, you know, possible. Well, that's... Uh... Uh, well, then, okay, so you look at the rock star <laughs> aspect, uh, which, and the idea, but then what strikes me is that you don't always get, I mean, you sometimes get people who are critical. How does that fit in? Or how does that, what, what is your response when people, or sometimes they get your book, you're saying one thing and someone gets it completely wrong. But how do you deal with that? Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I've been thinking, I, I, I don't think that for me the, <clears throat> the, um, the impulse is to connect, really. I think that, that really at, at the core of it, it's, it's, it's to build. It's, that it's as if everything, there are hundreds of little scattered bits and pieces everywhere. And if you can get the right ones and you can get them into the right order, you have a pattern and you have something that makes sense. And I, I, I think that's like the primary urge in me towards writing, I think is, is to do with that. 
Um, how do you respond to people to people's take on on your work? I, I think once you've written a book and it's out there, then really it is it isn't your property anymore. Um, people can do what they want with it. And I think as long as somebody can argue from text, then it's actually really interesting to listen. And I've had I've had. Um, perceptions and things pointed out to me that I hadn't actually thought of at all, but that in fact are arguable from text. So somebody told me that uh, in, in the eye of the sun, uh, there is a theme of statues, and that in fact the statues are all, something's wrong with each one of them. They're missing an arm or missing. And I looked at it and, and I thought, in fact, this is so true that there is actually a scene where there isn't a statue where I had had a statue it out for various reasons. Idea of the sort of the, the broken statues um, <clears throat> punctuating the book is is, is one. And, and somebody else did some uh, thesis on bathrooms in the work of Adef Suif. And you know it's funny, but actually I do find bathrooms really really important. Bathrooms, yeah. I and I like bathrooms and I'm curious about them. But I wouldn't have thought that they featured in in the work. But clearly they do. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm always, you know, as long as people are reasonably friendly, and if they're not, we can have a fight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting how often criticism isn't rooted in the text, because I was very careful to say that as long as it can be argued from the text, uh, in my experience, about 99% of the time, it cannot be. Uh, there's just sort of assertions that are made. Uh, I, I, for one, respond very badly. Uh, to criticism, uh, not just about my writing, I think in life in general. Uh, there's some people who maybe like to be criticized. That you keep going back to, and it's, 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 like a, it's, it's like a relief, a little exit from the world into that world for a while. And the same happens when you're writing. And I think that that's probably, that's why there's a moment in the process of writing when somehow you know that the world has been created. I mean, you haven't written the book, you've written a little bit of it, but the world of the book has been created, and it's at that point that you kind of have to give over to it. You were saying, you know, to hold it, to hold it in your mind. Um, and I find that if I stay away for too long, then a door closes and it won't let me back in. You have to, like, work really hard. And by working really hard to be allowed back in, it actually means sitting at the desk and accepting that nothing might happen for days, but you're just sitting there asking to be allowed. But then what back into that so I wanted to ask what, what determines <clears throat> uh, whether you decide to write fiction or non-fiction, and what is the difference between the two, and what do they achieve or don't achieve? <laughs> Sorry. Well, I mean, shall I, Adap shall I done, simplify that? Adap has done a lot of both, and so she'll, she'll uh, uh, have a more thoughtful answer than me, but I mean, I've done, I've done more fiction than non-fiction, but you know, quite a, quite a bit of non-fiction. Um, and I've, I've come to understand them as, as, um, as approaching uh, honesty in, in, in different ways. Um, so, uh, uh, fiction may be entirely invented, you know, the things that happen maybe didn't happen, you know, possibly there wasn't a toad, you know, with a motorcycle who was uh, challenged by weasels and foxes, um, but somehow there's an honesty to the telling of that story. Um, there's an honesty that you bring to the telling of that story, that you're, uh, uh, you're, you are telling the story in the way that you think it, it, it truthfully should be told. Um, which is something more about the stance towards the, the, the story, the, the words that you build the story of, the, your self-awareness, um, uh, your interrogating the deceptions that you have towards yourself as you're writing the story, um, all of these things. Uh, Nonfiction is different um, because if, if fiction is honest based on what it says and how it says what it says, to me, nonfiction very often is um, honest or dishonest based on what it leaves out. So you can write a piece of nonfiction that is factually true, um, but can be completely dishonest. And I think that, I think that in nonfiction, um, 
omission is much more important. You know, what part of the story are you not telling? So those of us who lived in Pakistan in the last 20 years, but particularly 10, the decade, the first decade of this century, you know, will remember all of this reporting about Pakistan, that this bomb went off and 12 people died and 28 were wounded and there was a terrorist uh, involved in doing this. And these things happened. Um, the nonfiction is true in the sense that these events occurred. Um, but almost never was it said that these things occurred in a city of 12 million people, um, you know, 11 million plus, 11.99 million of whom were really not part of these events, who are doing other things. Um, and in fact, that the, even counting this bomb, the homicide rate in Chicago was less, was more than in Lahore, you know, that month. Um, and so what, you know, what we saw in Pakistan was the crafting of a story about this place um, that omitted so much of what was happening here and, and created an impression um, that, you know, Pakistan is, is this sort of monster country um, which, which should frighten the world. And not just Pakistan, it's happened in many other places. It's happened in Egypt, Afghanistan, Iraq, all over. We see it happening even now, you know, with, uh, with Russia, for example. Um, leaving aside sort of the monstrous nature of, of Putin himself, but the idea that, that, that Russia is this horrible place um, that's always harmed others, is it full of... And so I think um, uh, to this question of fiction versus non-fiction, in non-fiction for me it's become very important to ask, you know, what is not being said? Uh, and so, you know, you, you look at the New York Times and its coverage, for example, of the Palestinian conflict. Um, you know, the fact checkers may get many of the facts correct, um, but of a thousand facts, if you pick three, uh, it's possible that 900 of the remaining 997 argue for a completely different interpretation of events. And so, and so, um, uh, and so I think that, you know, that, that nonfiction uh, lies in what it does not say, uh, almost more so. Uh, uh, then, then, and, and, and I think that um, nonfiction is therefore always invented. It's also always made up. And the part of it that's made up is the blank space, the stuff that doesn't get that said in the nonfiction. So, so they're, they're cousins, they just operate in, in, in mirror image uh, ways. But, but I'd be very interested to Adaf how you, how you respond because you've done so much of both. Well, <clears throat> I haven't. Um I have not published fiction um, for 20 years now, which is a long time. Um, and I kind of, uh, I, I hijacked myself into, into nonfiction um, on the back of the success of The Map of Love, which gave me a, a platform and room to uh, write nonfiction about the things I cared about. And it just was a, 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 a confluence of circumstances that uh, that map of love became well known at the end of uh, of uh, 1920. Um, oh God, um, 2000, 1999, something like that. But it was also the outbreak of the Second Intifada in Palestine, and so the Guardian asked me to go and cover it, or to go and write something from the ground, and uh, and and so I did that, and and I felt very. Um, I very realized in that I was using the skills that I had as a novelist to, to write a very accurate uh, reportage from, from Palestine and to, to bring the place and the people alive. And so there was, like, obviously, I was not inventing anything, but I was, I was making things come alive on the page. Um, and... And I, th I, th I thought, I thought that, that that was at the moment while I was doing it, while I was then fighting to get it published, even though it had been commissioned. Um, I felt that that was the best use of my, of you know whatever whatever skill, talent I had, and the position I was in to be able to 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 write sort of almost as an insider. In, in both both places, so I, I could write in the English idiom that would attract the English audience, but I would write truly from the Palestinian point of view and and from the ground. 
And so it was very, very hard to let go of that, really, and to let go of that sense of that this is what I must do, this is what I am for. And so I carried on doing that. Um, and uh, well, you wrote about your involvement in, in And then the I wrote about Egypt and Egypt, about the Egyptian your, Revolution. Yes, and then there was another the phase yes. in, in the Revolution where I actually then had a column, uh, a weekly column in Shuru, as, as you mentioned, which was the opposition, uh, well, the revolution, sort of, kind of, um, daily. And, and again, there was a very clear function to this because you knew what you were trying to do. You had a weekly, a weekly column in Arabic. At a time of revolution, you were trying to, to keep things going. You were trying to document. Eventually, when people started getting disappeared and started being put in prison, you were writing about them and for them, and you would get feedback that you were being read in the prisons and that you were giving people heart and so on. And, and so I, you carried on doing that until, until you were banned, because then, then it became impossible. And really, I guess, I, I mean, I don't have, like, I mean, I think that in both, as you say, in both fiction and nonfiction, we are reaching for some kind of, for some kind of truth. Um, probably in the fiction you're reaching for a, a, a more, I don't know, a more developed or a, a more, a wider scope of truth uh, somehow. But certainly, and we were talking before we came in, that I'm at a point where um, I, I, I'm banned from writing in Egypt and, um, and I have really no interest in writing about the Arab Spring for the West in English anymore. And so nonfiction is gone. And I then reminded myself that actually that even during a protest, even with the gas going, even in Palestine under occupation, people, particularly young people, would ask me, when is the next novel? And so, you know, um, I decided that maybe, maybe the, the, the more difficult engagement now, an engagement that might actually yield a richer result would be to 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 go back to fiction and to try and work work with all the things that I would have worked with in nonfiction to to work them w in fiction and see what that would what that would look like. It's looking very very difficult now. It, it, it's so interesting because you know, uh, as you say, that there was a, a long period of of not writing fiction for you. Um, there's been a, a much shorter, but still a couple of years period of not writing nonfiction for me. Um, uh, it, it began to taper off maybe three or four years ago, and then I didn't write any essays um, for a couple of years, and finally wrote one this fall uh, after the uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Kabul. Um, uh, which was motivated in part by some personal connections to that, to that story because my mother had gone to do her wedding shopping in Kabul in 1970. Um, and, uh, and just to reflect upon this city where in our imagination, and Kabul is not that far, I mean we live in Lahore and we think of Kabul as being very far away. But you can drive to Kabul, you know, it's, it, it, in one day, I mean you, it's whatever, uh, it's probably... Maybe maybe 12 hours you could drive there now if if there was a way to drive 15, but it's it's a day's drive. But of course, very almost nobody does drive to Kabul from Lahore now. But just what happened that place, and then I was asked to write a piece um, on the 20th anniversary of 9/11, and I said no. And then um, and then this was all happening in August, just before that, and I said, look, instead of the 20th anniversary of of Kabul, I'm, I'm uh, sort of interested in the 51st anniversary of my mother's shopping trip um, to do a wedding shopping and what has happened to this city uh, that was such an, uh, a wondrous beacon to people from all over flying to Kabul this amazing place where you could you know it was this place of freedom and excitement and um, a crossroads in every sense you know it was a, it was a port city um, in the giant sort of inland sea which is you know Eurasia uh, right in the middle is this place, Kabul, where all the ships or all the, the, the caravans would come. Um, and, and it has a big part of our own history. So I finally wrote this piece. But I was thinking as you were talking about, you know, why I wasn't writing fiction. I'm very curious to how your experiences in, in have, have been similar or different. 
Yeah, I think what you said, I, I mean, it reminded me again of something. It's, it's very interesting. This, um, it's a tricky position to be, well, to be from Pakistan and writing in the West or from Egypt and writing in and for the West about Egypt, about our, our region. And this thing of weaponizing that, that what you produce becomes weaponized against uh, the home country is, is really, in, th there's a double thing. There is what you write being used in the West against, against your country. Um, and there is that you are held up in your country as a traitor for writing about it in the West. And you've got both these things all the time. And what I used to do was, um, was every time I wrote a piece for the British or American press, I would translate it into Arabic, and it would appear in The Guardian today and appear in Al Haya or Al Shuru or something tomorrow. So that it was always uh, in both languages, and so that I, you know, could not be accused of saying one thing somewhere and, and one thing and. Um, so that, that, that was my answer. But yes, I mean, and, but that can happen. That actually does happen with fiction as well. Yes. On the Eye of the Sun, for example, there was a whole campaign. I mean, this was a long time ago, but in the Eye of the Sun, the novel, there was a campaign against me in Egypt because part of the story of the novel is an Egyptian woman abroad having an affair. She's a married woman and she has an affair with an Englishman. And so somebody set up a campaign where I was uh, slandering and defaming Arab women. And um, it was no use pointing out that that was a theme that was present in Arabic literature and so on. No, the issue was it was being written about in the West, in English. So you were kind of like hanging out our, our dirty washing in public kind of thing. And it, it really ran um, and it was only stopped because lots of big, big writers uh, stepped up to, to, to my defense, and that was fine. But again, because of that, I found myself when turning up to readings in Britain, for example, I would find a poster saying, hated and reviled in her home country, and if so, if blah. Well, I wasn't hated and reviled, and, and I didn't want that publicity anyway. I wanted to be able to keep moving between places and have access to both places. Um, and made sure I did, but it is, it is, it is a very, very tricky, tricky. It, 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 And as you say, it also does come over into the fiction because um, yeah. uh, it's not that, in, in not, in, not, not that in fiction we live in some place where you can say anything you want, right? Uh, fiction itself has enormous limitations in terms of what can be said and how it can be said and how people interpret it. You talked about, you know, when you're critiqued from the text, mm. but you are so often critiqued not from the text. Mm. You know, the, for example, this idea that, um, that it's, a, it's a slander of, of of Arab uh, women uh, to an affair is not really a critique from the text, no. right? It's, it's an idea of the text and then a critique of that idea of the text. And so much of talk about fiction is, does occur in, in that way. But, um, but when it comes back to fiction, it's interesting because in fiction we have so much room to, to, to find um, space to do what we want. It might take some time, it might take 20 years sometimes. Uh, my books tend to take between five and seven each, so it, you, you know, it looks like I'm not writing anything for, for many years at a time. Um, but for example, my, my next novel, which comes out in August, uh, is, called, is called The Last White Man. Yes, that and was it's, it's, that. it's the story of a, a man who wakes up and he, he's dark, but when he went to bed, he wasn't. Um, and, um, and this tragedy is sort of, it's called The Last White Man, and a story of a man who wakes up, he's dark. Oh, right. But when he went to bed, he wasn't. Right. Okay. And, um, and this sort of tragedy in his viewing of it has, has befallen him. Um, and as the novel progresses, this predicament progresses, and more and more people um, begin to be dark and are grappling with this, you know, with the horror uh, of, uh, uh, and in some cases liberation, depending on the character, of what this means. But, but I, um, I don't want to talk too much about that novel, I want to talk a little bit about why I wrote a book like that. Uh, it's a book with no Pakistani characters, or um, uh, no characters who are identified as such. Um, who knows what they are. Um, it's a book that doesn't occur in a place that is identifiably Pakistan. Um, it, it's a book uh, that actually occurs 
um, in the places where the books that I write in English um, tend to be published in the biggest numbers, you know, places like America or, or, or the UK. Um, and in a sense, it was, it was decades of dealing with this idea, the accusation in, of, of reporting one's dirty laundry to the outside. Um, uh, it felt interesting to me the notion of reporting um, dirty laundry from the inside uh, and venturing into a place where I don't obviously have permission to write. You know, um, I'm not white. Uh, I don't live in America. Um, I haven't changed color. You know, uh, I can't claim any of these things as giving me permission to write this story. But, uh, but yet I feel very, very strongly attached to it. And I think, I think that it's in some senses a response to what Adaf was talking about. The discomfort that accrues over the years and decades of writing, a perception that one is sort of struggling against of, of doing something wrong, of, of, of betraying one's tribe um, and, uh, and of being, being valorized for the act of betrayal, um, which I think is a false accusation, but it's nonetheless a constantly leveled accusation. It's the ecosystem and culture and water that we swim in you know, as, as, as brown fish uh, in, this, in this publishing sea. Um, and so for me, it was very important in fiction to try to take that sort of head on and to try to do a different kind of book, um, something that, that in a sense uh, um, was precisely the same as all of my other books um, and yet uh, completely impervious to this particular critique. Uh, 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 you know, unless the critique is, of course, that you really are white and you really are American and you're now betraying your American white roots to a Pakistani audience uh, uh, for cash and, and, uh, and, and success. But, but I think, I mean, that's why I was, I was very interested to hear about your coming back to fiction. The thing about fiction is that in, in fiction we have permission not just to tell these stories, um, but to build our own imaginary internal kind of interpretive frame inside which we are telling our story. You know, it's not The Guardian, it's not The New York Times, it's not Dawn. It's, it's you, what you imagine the space to be, and then into that you put your fiction. And so, um, and so yes, yeah, so in some senses, the not writing of nonfiction has deeply changed my fiction, at least as far as the next book is, is concerned. Um, I thought, should we open out to the, yes, let's open out uh, to the audience. Um, has anyone got any questions? I can't see it. I can't. Can you sort of have some light and yeah, some? Somebody, there's somebody at the back. I can't. Right. Great. Well, I can't see yeah, a yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. You can talk. We don't need to see you. Can we have a microphone somewhere? The light is. Yeah. Can you earn a living? Okay. Uh, can you earn a living by being a writer and for that to happen, does your writing have to be in English language? Uh, no, I had to sell my house actually. <laughs> well, you can, you can up to a point. I mean, after a lot of work and when you're established, you can earn a living, not a brilliant living, but a living. You know, the first 20 years that I was writing fiction, I began my, my first novel in the early 1990s. Uh, so the first 20 years, I always had another job. I, I was either a student, and my job was to be a student, and I, I wasn't losing any income by writing because I had no income anyway. Um, or when I finished being a student, I had a job, uh, and I would write on the weekends and in the evenings, and I would take time off. And um, I never thought you could actually make enough living from writing fiction to just write fiction. Uh, but then I moved back to Pakistan and I sometimes jokingly tell my friends who teach creative writing in New York that moving to Pakistan is like getting a creative writing job because it's so much cheaper than living in New York that actually um, you, you endow yourself uh, uh, to pursue this profession by living in a place where you can afford to do it. But 
um, I think I think Adaf's point is right, which is that it, which is that um, it's 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 very difficult to make a living as a writer uh, for a very long time. It's really kind of blind luck if you're able to do it after that. Um, there are a hundred more talented writers who are unable to make a living writing fiction for each one of us who manages to do it um, uh, and, and make a living at it. And you also asked about English. And I think you're right. I think that actually if you don't write in English, um, it is even more difficult. I mean, it depends on the language. If you write in Japanese or German, you know, maybe those are countries where you, you, you probably could, you know, I don't know, French or Spanish perhaps. Um, uh, at the level of Arabic, you still have many, many more readers uh, than, than you might in Urdu or, or, or certainly Punjabi. But, but I do think if you don't write in English, the ability to just make a living from writing is, is already much harder than it is uh, when you start off in English. But for anybody who's starting out, um, I think I wouldn't approach it as something that you do to make a living. Uh, I, I think that, that's a, that that is, a, is a, a mistake. And I think if I had approached it that way, I would never have been able to, uh, to be a writer now. I, I always approach this thing that, that I would never be able to make a living at. Um, and I was going to do something else to make a living. Um, and you know, there are famous writers who are dentists, and there are famous writers who are, you know, who are professors and journalists. And, um, and there's a reason for that, you know. Uh, and, it, and it seems like it's always been the case. You know, Tolstoy had his estates, um, and uh, you know, uh, and even even Virginia Woolf had her room, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which you know she had the background that allowed her to do it. But um, but I guess the last thing I'd say is is don't don't do it thinking you're going to make a living at it. But um, but certainly do it if you think the life you can make doing it will be better than the life you can do without it. Which isn't a, a, a sort of an economic argument, it's just what will your life feel like if you don't do it? Um, but yeah, that would be my, my sense. I agree, I agree completely. I had a job, um, I mean, obviously first I was a student and then I had, I had a job and I had jobs all the way through until, until I actually went back to Egypt. Uh, for, for the revolution, and so it's more or less the same trajectory because, again, living in Egypt is a lot cheaper than living in London, and so it's possible to, to exist. But I, again, I never went into it to make a living, and in fact, I think it's quite good to have the writing activity separate from the business of earning a living and how much money you're going to make because it, it, it sets you free. I mean, you're not, you're not there isn't something at the back of your mind wondering if you should perhaps be doing something differently in order to, to make money, you know? Okay, uh, in addition to your question, that from where a writer get inspiration or motivation to write uh, something, uh, as we have a general perception that, uh, you know, the writer are more sensitive human beings, as we see, so if a writer, you know, uh, like to um, write something, um, I mean to say he could, not, uh, he could not help writing if he has to write something because uh, I have read somewhere that writing is a complicated process and it is a difficult process. It is just like um, giving child birth, I mean, to say, uh, I mean to say if you don't write and if you have a story uh, to uh, tell and you are not, uh, you can say, like to write and you are not able to write. It means uh, your anxiety may increase if you're not going to write something. And this is a story that is not told earlier, and it becomes more anxiety. I'm, I'm sorry. Can is it so? Is it so? Can you hear? I heard, I heard someone, this is a noise coming from behind us. I don't know what, what that is. It's very difficult. We can't yeah, actually but, but, hear us anyway. Yeah, so I don't know what, what's happening back there, but um, maybe somebody from here can check, but it's over anyway. But, um, the idea that if, if, if you don't write a story, your anxiety grows and, and there's something that happens in the act of not writing, uh, was, 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 it sounded like that was part of your question. And, um, you know, I think that uh, uh, it's definitely true that, that not writing has its own cost and, and price and um, anxiety and other things that it, that it uh, induces. Um, you know, not writing has, has, has a very real cost, particularly if you're a writer. Uh, uh, you know, aside from making a living, but it just it just is is a is a difficult uh, uh, thing to sustain. But you know, one one image that I, I I keep coming back to is the idea of of digging a well. And Adap said earlier that you know if you don't 
uh, come back to it, that space that suddenly opens up in your mind, it closes and you lose that world that you suddenly see opening and you're writing your fiction. And then, um, it's the same with when you don't write, you know, it, it begins to close. And, and that's why I like to think of it much more as digging a well, which is that you, you create a void in your life, uh, a certain number of hours each day where you are trying to tell a story. And then into that void, that hole, you know, the, like water, uh, comes in the words and what you're going to write. Um, it's not like climbing a mountain where you can just stop uh, halfway up the mountain and wait for a few weeks and then, you know, I, I think you have to have this practice of, of making space uh, every, in your day, an empty space in your day, which is where the writing happens. Uh, and for me, when I don't make that space, which I think was partly what you're asking, um, bad things happen. You know, if I, if I don't try to write, uh, I, I become cranky and I become pretty miserable. Yeah. I don't know what you think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I kind of like very quickly start feeling quite worthless. Like, you know, why, why, why do I exist? You know, why am I taking up space? Um, it's, yeah, you, you sort of j justify your existence by, uh, by writing somehow. Uh, there was uh, the lady. Adila, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, it's great. Can, uh, am I audible? Okay. No. Uh, first of all, I want to mention that it's a great talk. And I have two questions. Uh, first is that, uh, do you believe that you fix your time to have a synchronization between your thoughts and your pen? And my second question is, uh, reading is very important uh, for writing, right? So when you are reading, so then you are reading just for the sake of reading and enjoying it, and then you put your ideas on paper. So how, uh, what is your process on that? Thank you. So, you, you, so I think the second question was about, was about um, do you read for enjoyment or do you read in a different way because reading is such a, so important for a writer? How do you approach reading as a writer? That was the second question. Right. Maybe we can start with that. I think. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's interesting, actually. Um, <clears throat> okay. I would. I, I. still read for enjoyment. Well, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that you have to read because you have to read because somebody asked you to write a blurb or somebody wants your opinion and, and so on. So you do a lot of reading that isn't what you would choose. Um, but picking up, picking up, say an old favorite again. You you read it for enjoyment, but also I now like will stop and see how they did what they did. You know. So for example, I I had never read Ursula Le Guin. Le Guin, yeah. Ursula Le Guin. I'd never read her, um, and then I came across something that she'd said about how you divide up your day. And it was really interesting to me. Um, and so I picked up a book of hers. And whereas, like, if I was a child or a teenager, I would have just read it and enjoyed it, I started reading and I was just stopping at every few sentences to say, look how she did this. Look how with 15 words, she's made me see a whole spectacle. So you're, you're just much more conscious of, of the craft of it, really, and admiring of it. Whereas, as a, an ordinary act of reading, you just let it work on you um, without picking at it too much. Yeah. Okay. One last question, okay. Right. Stamrikom, this one's from Mohsin Saab. Uh, this is about your first book, The Reluctant Fundamentalist. You left it on a cliffhanger, leaving it open for the reader's uh, interpretation. So I just want to know what your thought process was and where you imagine the end to be of that book to be. Thank you. Well, uh, so Dr. Fernandez was, was, my, was my second book. So the first one was Moth's book. Um, but yeah, uh, so I don't really have an ending for that book. Um, but it, it's, it steps back a little bit. The question I want to step back from a little bit more is that I don't think that's my job. So. We, we began by talking about this idea of connection um, and, uh, and Adaf was talking about how perhaps more than connection, it's building something in your mind. Um, 
Uh, and I think I, I, I agree with both of those ideas that I think for me writing is about connection and it is also about building something in your mind. Um, and for me the connection in a way is that I imagine that my books are a chance for readers to also build something. Um, and so I'm not only building something by myself, I'm building something that then somebody else will build something from. Uh, and uh, so it's not like um, when the book is done, it doesn't actually exist. Uh, uh, it's, it's just these words. And then when somebody reads it, the book exists. But when it is read, it's no longer just those words. It's people and it's emotions and it's images. And it's been transformed by that reader into something. So I very much um, uh, approach my writing, my writing as writing half novels that other people, the reader, you know, writes in their imagination. And so that novel, The Latin Fundamentalist, was a novel that very much was about how do we see each other, or more importantly, how do you, reader, see a situation? And so it was not meant for me to say this is the correct answer at the end of the book. It was meant to be a kind of mirror where at the end the readers left with what were they feeling at the end? They made that feeling. And if they made that feeling, what does it tell them about themselves? Uh, so, so I don't have an ending in mind. But I'd, I'd actually love to get, uh, I know it's our last question, but just a quick Adaf's response to this idea as well about, about how do you imagine the reader as, as a maker of your, of your books? To what extent do you think of them in that way? Uh, oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, basically, I think that the act of, uh, the act of reading is not a passive act. The reader engages with, with, with the book and I thought that was a beautiful image that you, uh, you put pieces together to construct something, to build something, to give to the reader, to build something with. Uh, so we're all sort of, it's a, 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 chain, a chain of building actually. Um, so yeah, I agree and I, th I, I, th I, think, I think it's beautiful that you're laying it out there and the reader will, it within their own, their own system, their own galaxy, as it were, um, and, 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 and make something with it. Yeah, totally. Well, I, I think... And I'll that's why I think, that's why I think when people, when people say, oh, this is too difficult, or oh, you know, explain, this, I'm, I'm just very, very conscious that the reader is smart and that the reader is working alongside me and that if the reader is engaged, then if a clue has been thrown out or something has been explained in page 15, then it's alienating to explain it again or give another clue to it on page 30 because you're breaking that, that idea of, you know, we're working together on this and, and, and we're keeping pace with each other. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I think our time is up. Thank you, Mohsen. I'm glad you're writing it. Thank you.